Good morning. A few months ago, and you may remember, I began a lesson by quoting the words to a song that I said came from one of the television shows that my children like to watch. Well, services ended that day. We got in the car and started home. And one of the kids, I think it was Kaylee, she said, Dad, you didn't get that right. And they commenced at that point to sing that song. And in fact, I've got a few of the words crossed. It didn't change the message that I was trying to get across, but they corrected me in what I had done wrong. You know, no one likes to be told they're wrong. But sometimes it's easier to take than at other times. You know, that didn't bother me at all. In fact, I got a little chuckle out of that time. But I don't think there's a soul here this morning that can honestly say we like to be told we're wrong. And there's even fewer that would say that we like to receive correction, be it verbal or physical, whatever the case may be, for the things that we do wrong. But probably we all as well have had those experiences where we have done something wrong and where someone has come to us and had our best interests at heart. And they come to us and they confront us with either something we've done wrong or something that we're believing or practicing that's contrary to the truth. And they tell us that we need to make a change in our life. This is not the easiest thing to accept. It's not the easiest thing, the most pleasant experience for us to go through. But those times like that should always be a transformative experience for us. In fact, as children of God, we should reach the point where we come to appreciate rebuke. We as children of God should always have the desire that if we are doing something that's wrong, that we want someone to tell us about it. We want someone to care enough about our soul that they come to us and they let us know the things that may be going wrong in our life. And you know, sometimes it may be a, 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 a misconception on their part. They may believe something in our life is wrong, but then when they talk to us, they may find that that's not the case. But it may be that that rebuke is necessary. It may be that it is warranted, and that change needs to take place in our life. Well, that may be why David, in Psalm 141, and particularly in verse 5, says these words, Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. But also, I want you to turn over to the book of 2 Timothy for just a moment. And what we're going to do, we're going to look at the last two verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3, and then the first two verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. In these verses, and these are verses that are very familiar to us, Paul writes these words, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But then look at the first two verses of the next chapter. I charge thee therefore... Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant or be ready, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So notice what we see. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. It says that we are to be rebuking and we are to be correcting. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 says, correct, rebuke, encourage. Twice, 
in a span of only four verses. Do we see a connection here between the power that is contained in God's word and the necessity of rebuke? This correction that must take place. Now rebuke is really a novel concept to many people today. It is a much more physical form of religion than most people want to practice today. And much of that is because the society that we live in today is a very passive society, very tolerant. We're told that just let people live and let live. However they want to live their life, you just ignore it. You live your life how you want to live it, and everybody will be at peace with each other. But that's not what the scriptures teach. That's not what we as children of God are told that we need to do. And so when the Bible tells us that we are to be practicing this ministry of rebuke, folks, this is a revolutionary idea. People have never heard things like this before. But the importance of this is obvious when we realize that over a hundred times in the Bible we find examples of God telling his people that rebuke is something that must take place. Well, as in all things, we look to Jesus as our ultimate example. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 33, it says, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. This is the occasion when Jesus has told his disciples that he has to go to Jerusalem, that he's going to die on the cross. And Peter has spoken up and he says, no, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. This is not going to happen to you. Well, after Peter has said this, Jesus turned about and he looked upon the disciples and notice what it says, and he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Simply put, Peter was wrong. Peter was not conducting himself in a way that he should he was saying things that he should not say, believing things that he should not believe, and he needed to be corrected. Jesus rebuked him, and because of this rebuke that took place, Peter went on to be a better man, a much stronger man from that point forward. Peter was wrong. We also find the example in Mark 16 and verse 14. Where it says, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Remember, there were those that Jesus appeared to before he appeared to the eleven. And they came to the eleven and they say, Jesus has risen from the dead. We've seen him with our own eyes. And they said, "Huh." uh that's not the case. Like we say so often today, I'm not going to believe it till I see it. But Jesus appeared to them. They were enjoying a meal together and Jesus appeared to them. And notice what he did. He rebuked them. Now something I want you to pay close attention to here. Folks, what they were doing was not some minor problem. It was not some minor issue that could just be overlooked. Folks, they were denying the resurrection of Jesus. And so he rebuked them strongly for the things that they were doing, for what they were believing. It was their stubborn refusal to accept what they were being told. Even though there were a multitude of people coming to them saying, We've seen Jesus. Jesus is risen. They say, well, we've not seen him. We're not going to believe it till we see him. They did not believe, and he was rebuked. But something else that the scriptures teach, and this is where a lot of people have a misconception about what rebuke really is. Rebuke is always to be a mark of love. We love and we care about that person's soul enough that we're willing to go to them 
and confront them about the things that are going wrong in their life, the things that they're doing wrong. We're brave enough because of the love we have for them to go to them with that problem. Leviticus 19 and verse 17, we find these words. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart, but notice this, rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Think about the life of David for just a moment. One of David's greatest failures. Now we could say that David was a great man. He truly was. He was a man after God's own heart. He accomplished many wonderful things. But David had a few failures in his life as well. And one of the areas where David was a great failure was as a parent. As a father. 1 Kings 1 and verse 6 It says that David never rebuked Absalom by asking, why have you behaved as you do? David's affection for Absalom was so strong. The love that he had for his child was so strong that he would not correct his child even though he knew Absalom was doing things that was not right. He wouldn't do this correction. He would not engage his son in this way. But folks, if he had truly loved Absalom the way that he should, he would have came to this young man. And he would have corrected those things. He would have called him out, rebuked him for those sinful things that he was engaging in. And quite possibly, Absalom's life may not have ended up in the ruin that it ended up in. But his father didn't care enough to do this. And sadly, we see a lot of parents like that in the world around us today. We see too many parents today that are afraid they're going to upset their child. That are afraid they're going to make their child mad. That they're going to lose a buddy. And so they just let that child walk all over them. They let that child do whatever that child wants to do. And then these very same parents are the ones who years down the line are so upset because that child has brought such shame and such disappointment to them. And they wonder how that could be, why that could be. Because they did not train that child. They did not rebuke that child in the way that they should. Remember Solomon very wisely said in Proverbs 13 and verse 24, he said, he that spareth his rod. And this is talking about correction. It's not necessarily talking about uh, corporal punishment, things like spanking, things of that nature. And I'm not opposed to that. I was spanked growing up and I didn't grow up with a warped sense of reality or whatever. I'm not opposed to that. But different children need different forms of correction. Different, uh, different transgressions, if you want to use that term, require different forms of correction. But Solomon said, he that spares the rod, meaning he that does not punish that child, who, correct, who does not correct that child when they do something wrong, says, hates his son. That's pretty strong language. Hates his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. When the time comes that correction has to take place, mom and dad have to be willing to do it. You know, it's not the school's job. It's not the state's job. It's not grandma and grandpa's job. It's mom and dad's job. Jesus told the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3 and verse 19, Those whom I love I rebuke and I chasten. But in spite of the fact that the Bible talks so much about this concept of rebuke, this is something that is practiced so little. So the question that I want us to look at in our last remaining minutes this morning is this. When should we rebuke and how should we rebuke? I want to share with you just briefly five suggestions that we need to look at when it comes to this subject of rebuke. First, we must rebuke. 
Whenever we see that a person's willful, sinful behavior is hurting themselves or hurting someone else. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, we see three words set before us. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. These three words imply three different approaches to correction. Another way that we might put this, we see the intellectual, we see the moral, and we see the emotional. Let me explain this a little bit more. If someone is battling spiritual doubt, or they are considering the practice of false doctrine, they need to be convinced. So a person goes to them and they use the intellect, they use their knowledge of the scriptures to correct the things that are going on in that person's thought processes. But then also, sometimes Christians grow discouraged. They get beat down, they're down and out. And all they need is someone to come along and offer a word of encouragement, exhortation. Build them up, strengthen them in their faith. But then thirdly, sometimes we see those who just absolutely will not change who know the way that they're living is not right, and regardless of what is said, regardless of what is done, regardless even if they know the scriptures are opposed to it, they will not change. This is when rebuke must take place. Now let me say this at this point. I'm glad that the word exhort is in this passage. Exhort basically means to encourage because to me, what this reminds me is that our goal is always to be positive. Our goal is to always be restoring the erring, to rescue the perishing, to bring them back into a right relationship with the Father. That is always to be our goal. But at the same time, I'm glad that the word exhort is not the only word in this passage. Because frankly, sometimes it takes more than a word of encouragement. Sometimes there are situations that we face that it's going to take more than just a pat on the back. But for so many people, it seems like encouragement's the only tool that they have in the toolbox. Regardless of what a person may be engaging in, well, let's just go and encourage them. Folks, sometimes it takes more than that. Well, you know, Joe stopped coming to church. Let's go give him some encouragement. Jane's been going all over town, running down the church. Well, let's go give her a word of encouragement. Well, Jim, he went down here on the square, went to the bar, got drunk again last night, got in a fight, and got thrown in jail again. Let's go give him a word of encouragement. Uh, Bob's been beating his wife again. Let's go give her a word of encour or go give him a word of encouragement. John's been neglecting his family. Let's go give him a word of encouragement. Folks, if encouragement was a one size fits all remedy to every spiritual malady that came along, then Paul would have not told Timothy that there are three different tactics that need to be taken and one of them is rebuke there eventually comes to a point where encouragement is not what a person needs sometimes a person has to be knocked down to their knees so to speak the rug needs to be pulled out from under them they need to be told point blank that what they're doing is sinful the first principle that we need to consider is this. When we see someone's sinful actions causing them pain or causing pain to someone else out of a spirit of love, we should go to that person and tell them this has to stop. You have to change. Secondly, we have to rebuke when there is a clear violation of Scripture taking place. Before we tell someone that they're wrong, we better be at least fairly sure that what they're doing is unscriptural. 
We better be sure that the actions that they are engaging in is something that stands opposed to the Word of God. Not our opinions, not our preconceived notions, not our pet peeves, but the Word of God. Remember Paul said, all Scripture, let me say that again, all Scripture, now hold on, what, what if I disagree with the way that person's living? Well, if it's not opposed to Scripture, keep it to yourself. That's your opinion. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, we all have our own ideas. We have our own uh, opinions. We have our own little idiosyncrasies that are a part of who we are as an individual. But that's what makes us unique. But we can't expect everyone to pattern themselves after the way that we live our lives except where, where, where our lives are in keeping with the Word of God. We have different likes whenever it comes to the kind of home we live in. We have different likes when it comes to the kind of vehicle we drive. We have different likes when it comes to the styles of clothing we wear, the way that we fix our hair, or the things that we like to eat. We have different likes. We have different dislikes. But we can't enforce those things on somebody else. We cannot impose those things on someone else. But when it comes to Scripture, we better be willing and ready to stand up. It's like Paul told Timothy, and I know at this point he's talking to a young preacher, but this applies to everyone. When he says to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. I heard that described this way one time. He said, always be ready to defend the word of God when you want to and when you don't want to. Let that sink in for just a minute. You know what, there's times when the mortal man is telling us, you know, you really don't need to say anything. The mortal man is telling us, that's none of your business. The mortal man tells us, that person's going to get mad at you. You don't need to say anything. But always be ready. Always be willing. When you want to. And when you don't want to. Third. We need to rebuke when we know that we have our life right first. Folks, there is nothing that is more damaging to the cause of Christ than a hypocritical Christian. Someone who is living a life of sin, going out trying to correct people that are living in other forms of sin. We don't need to be going out trying to correct anybody else until we know that we're doing our dead level best to live the Christian life ourselves. This is part of the reason why Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 1 to rebuke not an elder. There's some other manuscripts that have been found of the book of 2 Timothy that have these words also in there, rebuke not an elder without cause. Simply put, if there is someone who is older than you, that's been a Christian longer than you, unless you have the evidence to prove that that person is not living their life right, don't go and try to correct that person. Leave that to someone else. But also, correction is not something that is to be done casually or disrespectfully. It's not to be done with a sense of smugness. We're not to go and present ourselves as someone that's holier than thou. We're not to present ourselves in such a way that we position ourselves as being any better than that person who has fallen into sin. Because we've been there too, folks. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe not right at that point, but at some point we were there. There's no difference. Going back to something that, that Don mentioned in preparing our thoughts for the Lord's Supper. 
One thing also that we had discussed back in the foyer this morning, was there really anything different in what Judas did and in what Peter did in the eyes of God? No. They both sinned. They both denied Christ. The difference is one repented and one didn't. One changed and one did not. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual or you who are faithful, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. This means that we do this in kindness and peace and love. We don't go to that person with the intent of stirring up trouble. We don't go to that person with the intent of, of trying to hurt them in any way. We simply go to that person with the intent of getting them to change. But also he says, but consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Consider the way that you're handling this. Considering the way that you approach that person. I'm convinced that the best person to go and rebuke another person is the one who doesn't want to do it. Folks, I never want to have to go to a brother or sister in Christ and tell them that they're living in sin. I don't want to do that. But if we ever get to the point where we take joy in seeing the shortcomings of others, that we find joy in going and correcting others and pointing out the things that they're doing wrong, folks, we better keep our mouths closed. Going back to another verse that Dad read for us a few moments ago, we should be praying to God to set a guard over our lips, making sure the things that we say have been seasoned, that we consider those things in light of the scriptures and we conduct ourselves in such a way that yes, we're going to reach that desired effect of getting that person to repent, but also that we do it in such a way that it doesn't cause us to sin in the process. That our intention is where it needs to be. Number four. And folks, this is one that I am very passionate about when rebuke must take place do it face to face face to face Galatians 2 and verse 11 but when Peter was come to Antioch I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed now you may recall this was not a trivial matter in fact, if Peter had continued in the course that he was going in, he was going to turn a lot of people back to the old law. And he was going to carry a lot of Gentiles there with him as well. What he was doing was something that was very serious. He could have wrecked the church with what he was doing. So when Paul was able to meet Peter, he met him face to face. He cared enough about Peter, cared enough about Peter's soul, cared enough about the church that he went to that person face to face. Now, this is the most honest way to handle these things. It's not always the most pleasant. It's not always the easiest way. But it's the most honest way to handle these difficulties. But so often, we want to talk about people behind their back. Or we want to go and we want to tell somebody else, hoping that somebody else will go and do the correcting for us. Or we want to send them an anonymous letter. Or we want to send them a text message or send them an email or call them on the phone. But we don't care enough to sit down with them face to face, show how much we care, and correct the problem. Every now and then, I receive unsigned letters. 
Most of the time it has something to do with something I've said on the radio that someone disagrees with. After reading these letters to see if there's any merit to the things that's being said, you know, I am human, I do have the ability to make mistakes. But after reading those letters, if someone has not cared enough to let me know who that is so that I can go to them and talk to them in person about that, folks, those letters go in the trash. It's not worth my time to worry over those things if it's not something that I can do anything about. We need to be willing to handle these things in person. And very quickly, point number five. We need to rebuke and we can honestly say that we care enough about that person that we want them to change. Even though it may hurt them, even though it may hurt us, Ephesians 4 and verse 15 uses the word speaking the truth in love. That's a wonderful statement. A powerful concept to consider. That's a hard combination to beat. Speaking the truth, but doing it in a loving fashion. I've heard it said this way. Don't ever discipline a child that you do not love. Well, that's true for a fellow Christian as well. Do not ever rebuke someone that you do not love. I'm often told that lessons that I've presented have stepped on people's toes. But something I want you to consider in closing this morning is this. The point... And I step on my toes just as much as I step on anybody else's. But the point at which the preacher makes you feel the most uncomfortable, the most displeased, or even the most angry, just might be the point that you need to listen to the most. Because there's something in your life that's making you feel that way. There's something in your life that needs to be considered because this just might be an indication that God's word is working on your heart. Trying to convince you, trying to prick that heart to show you the things in your life that need to change. Solomon said in Proverbs 3 and verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. So yes, as children of God, we must get to the point that we appreciate rebuke. We appreciate it when someone comes to us and tells us that there is something in our life that is amiss that we need to change. We need to be willing to consider those things. And just as Brother Jared mentioned in his prayer earlier, We need to have open minds, open eyes, open hearts. Because it just might be that there's something in our life that's amiss. There might be something there that we're not picking up on, but someone else might be able to. They bring those things to our attention, not because they hate us, not because they want to hurt us or bring us any uh, any type of shame, but because they love us, because they want us to go to heaven. That's always to be our intention, to bring about that positive effect, restore the erring, and rescue the perishing. This morning, if you consider yourself allowed sin to enter in and to pull you away from God, then we would encourage you this morning, turn away from those things. Repent. Come forward and let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf and be restored to the faith this morning. Or it may be that there is someone here who is still wandering in the darkness of sin. You've never turned away from your old way of life and become a Christian. Then we would encourage you to obey the gospel call this morning. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
Christ and repent of your sins. Come forward, confess that faith that you have in Christ and be baptized. All of those past sins will be washed away. And as John says, if you continue to walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse you of your sins. This morning, if you examine yourself and there's a spiritual need that we can help you with this morning, please come forward and make that known while together we stand and sing.